Even today, governments are all too ready to impose their economic policies as if they were some form of holy writ. That was certainly true in the summer of 1846 when the Whigs acceded to power. Their accession was a disaster for Ireland because it put responsibility for Irish affairs in the hands of men who believed passionately in free trade. They believed passionately in that trade and didn't want to meddle with market forces unless it were absolutely necessary. The new Whig Prime Minister, Lord John Russell, was a devotee of free trade and knew little of Irish affairs. And the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Sir Charles Wood, was bigoted in his views. Many other English MPs also regarded private enterprise as sacrosanct and were rigidly opposed to government interference in the marketplace. I do not think the way to raise the condition of the people is to give relief from any public fund. It is clear that the Irish pauper does not like work. I object to the principle of taxing the people in this country to relieve the distress of Ireland. These were also the views of Charles Trevelyan, the civil servant in charge of Irish famine relief. He was devout, narrow-minded, and convinced that God and market forces were on the same side. He saw uh, the famine as uh, a visitation of God, uh, as a way of solving uh, a very serious overpopulation problem. And uh, he believed that by and large, uh, the government shouldn't intervene very much, uh, because in the long run, that would uh, make things uh, even worse. If the Irish uh, weren't taught a lesson or didn't learn a lesson, uh, in the late 1840s, then who knows, in the 1850s or the 1860s, uh, the same was going to happen again, and they would have to go through perhaps even a worse catastrophe. Uh, now, that was the way uh, Trevelyan uh, thought. Uh, critics argued that uh, people who are starving needed food, not lessons in what was known in those days as political economy. Uh, Trevelyan was very well-intentioned, but uh, uh, not a very humane man. And uh, the, the atti his attitudes um, were responsible for, uh, undoubtedly, for uh, lots of deaths. In the summer of 1846, the potato crop promised a bumper harvest, and many people believed the danger of famine was over. But they were wrong. On the 27th of last month, I passed from Cork to Dublin, and this doomed plant bloomed in all the luxuriance of an abundant harvest. Returning on the third instant, I beheld with sorrow one wide waste of putrefying vegetation. I saw the crop, I smelt the fearful stench, now so well recognized as the death sign of each field of potatoes. I saw my splendid crop fast disappearing and melting away under this fatal disease. Stress and fear was in every countenance. There was a great rush to dig and sell, or consume the crop by feeding pigs or cattle, fearing in a short time they would prove unfit for any use. For many months, the government refused to reopen the stores of Indian corn, convinced that nothing should disrupt the free market in food. The result was widespread starvation. I confess myself unmanned by the extent of the suffering I witnessed. More especially amongst the women and the little children, crowds of whom were seen to be scattered over the fields like a flock of famishing crows. 
mothers uttering exclamations of despair whilst their children were screaming with hunger. They passed through three stages. At first they faced starvation manfully, too proud to accept grudged help. Then they were mad with despair. Then they were full of hopeless resignation. The hunger is on us. Tis the will of God. The will of God be done. <laughs> 